We are so glad that you are here today. Thank you so much for coming. I know you could have worshipped any place you wanted to, but you chose Dorisville Baptist Church. And my prayer today is, is that we really will experience, already in worship, oh my, the worship was wonderful, but through his word today, it really might speak to our hearts. Now we're about, well, no, we're more than smack dab in the middle, aren't we? We've come just a little bit further than the middle in our series on the Ten Commandments. And we're taking this ancient truth and bringing it right into our lives today. And that's, I tell you what, the Word of God is living and powerful, and more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I tell you, this is a message I really pray God will use it to speak to our hearts. Now, I know I've got something on that I don't ordinarily wear. I I heard y'all laughing. I don't know how long I'm going to keep the coat on. I do not know. I'm trying to change it up a little bit. But I want y'all to know something. There's actually, I'm going to be very candid with you. There are two reasons I don't normally wear a coat. One is the silly things have hung in my closet and shrunk. You know, the humidity in Southern Illinois is terrible. And I, you know, I, I've only got about two or three that, you know, by the way, I can still button it. Praise the Lord for that. So, so we're grateful for that. And the other reason is, you know, I, I uh, work up a lather up here when I preach. And I told somebody this morning, I told little Dave this morning, we were walking, he goes, Brother Dwayne, you look pretty snappy today. I said, well, thank you, little Dave. I appreciate that. I said, there is a reason, you know, it's, well, I don't wear coats. And I said, usually I work up a sweat when I preach. And I said, for all the years, I said, I was old fashioned. You know, I wear, wear a suit coat or a suit every single week. And every single week I got up on the stage and I took my coat off. And I said, finally, I said, if you're going to take your coat off, why are you wearing the silly thing anyway? So that's how the coat kind of became thing. But hey, I'm trying to change things up. If I have to lose this, this thing that's, you know, causing all the attention, um, then you'll just know that's, that's the reason why. Wait, wait, you're, you're looking at me still like you don't get it. Oh, it's the glasses, isn't it? Oh, it's the glasses. Well, there's a reason I'm wearing them today, too. You know, these are not ordinary glasses. These are special glasses. And they really are, by the way. Um, I have a television And my TV is a 3D TV. Now, I know some of y'all have never seen a 3D thing at all, but some of you have. And you know you put on these special glasses, and if you got the special movie and the special TV, then all of a sudden, when you start watching the special movie through your special TV with the special glasses on, things really begin to change. All of a sudden, that image that's flat on the screen just jumps out at you. In fact, now I've only got two movies. One's about the ocean and one's uh, the, the one about the Lion King. You know, that's only two I've got. But, but I'm telling you, the other night, Judy and I sat down. And can you imagine Miss Judy with these things on? And she's sitting in the room and she's, she's, she came in. And I said, here, sit down, put on these glasses. And so all of a sudden she went, oh, Wow. And the little fishies were swimming out in space. I mean, they literally jump out of your TV. It gives you a whole new perspective on what you're watching. And I realized that's exactly what I've been trying to say over the last weeks. And I just can't get over it. And that is, when we look at the Ten Commandments, really, when we look at everything God-wise through the lens of love God, love people, well, you know what? It really does change everything. It really does. All of a sudden, things become crazy. In fact, you know, if you look at the TV screen without these special glasses, when it's showing the special movie on the special TV, everything's fuzzy. It's all fuzzy. But when you put these on, all of a sudden, it just explodes in clarity. And I'm telling you, I believe with all my heart that if we will take the Word of God and look at it through the lens of loving God and loving people, it really does just change everything. You know, he said those, he said a couple times in different formats, but, but Matthew 22, you know, he was asked about the great commandment, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, well, you need to love God with your heart, your soul, and your mind, okay? And then your neighbor is yourself. And on this, on those two things, the whole law hinges. 600 and I think like 30 mosaic laws. And, and he said, all of that hinges on loving God and loving people. Now, let me pause a minute because the introduction today is kind of long. So don't think you're going to be here till 2 o'clock. You won't. The bulk of the message kind of is up at the front. So don't panic, okay? I got the glasses off, so don't panic too much, okay? I know y'all sitting there going, he's finally jumped over the edge. He's fine. We knew he was going. 
Got someone call Carrier Mills. He's coming. He's coming. But, but you know, so, so we sit there and we look at it through this wonderful lens. But here's the question. What kind of heart, what kind of soul, and what kind of a mind? See, see if, we love, if we love our neighbor as ourselves, and, and we truly love ourselves, now not in that narcissistic way, not in that weird way, but, but you know, we understand, like for instance, all you have to do is understand who you are in God, and all of a sudden you have a new view of who you are. God, I'm telling you, some people, people today, you sit there and you, you think you're a bunch of losers and you're worthless, and I'm telling you, one, you know, the old cutesy saying, God doesn't make junk, but God sent Jesus. And Jesus died on this cross because he saw the value of you. Not that you were worthy, but because he loved you so much. And he sent his son Jesus Christ to die. I mean, how valuable is that to us? So when we start seeing the value that God sees in us and he loves us, that changes how we're going to love our neighbor. And, and if we love our neighbor with a pure heart, we love God with a pure heart. That's going to be different. We'll treat people differently. And, and if, if we're going to love them with a restored soul, that, 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 that part of us that's deep inside, you know, it will change everything. When, when, we, when we love our neighbor and love God with a, with a not tormented mind, you know what I'm talking about. You know, your mind, you know, Satan messes with your mind. And when you start loving God with a renewed mind, like Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 12, it really changes everything. But you know what the reality is? The reality is we don't. Like I shared last week, you know, the problem is we do love our neighbor and we do love our neighbor as ourselves, but most of us just simply don't see the value of who we are. And again, don't take this as, as, as you, know, a, a, you know, one of these sermons where you know how great we are instead of how great he is. But when we don't see the value of that, we love our neighbor. And if we see ourselves as worthless, then we're going to love our neighbor in a worthless way. If we don't like us, we're not going to like our neighbor. In fact, I'll go even a step further. If we hate ourselves, we will love our neighbor with, our neighbor with hate. Isn't that just a real paradox? And, and what about if, if we love God with our heart, but what if our heart is, like we mentioned last week, toxic? What if our heart is sick and we try to love God with that heart? It's going to reflect how we see him and how we respond to him. What about if we, if we love God with this tormented soul thing? You know, sometimes we, you know, the Bible says, if he may be in Christ, he's a new creation. But, you know, some things that God works on in our life doesn't happen instantly. Sometimes it does. We're, we're made new. We're regenerated brand new. Yes. But some things it takes God through sanctification a while to work. And what if we love God with his tormented soul? Then it's going to be a twisted kind of love. And, and, and what if we love God with a, with a tormented mind, a, a crazy twisted mind? You can see where it would be hard to love God the right way if our heart's not good and, and our soul's not good and, and, and our, our mind's not good. Now, let me tell you this. If it's true that all the law hinges on this, you can probably imagine that if we have a, a heart with a problem and a soul with a problem and a mind with a problem and we have a problem with us, all of a sudden, Exodus 13, 14, and 15 become a big problem. You know, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Those become big problems now. All of a sudden, all of a sudden those things become things we don't desire to obey in. And then Jesus, come, then Jesus comes along, like we talked about last week. Then Jesus comes along and like really ramps up the scale. You know, the law says, you know, you should not murder. But Jesus comes along in the Sermon on the Mountain and says, now, wait, wait, wait. The law says you should not murder. I'm telling you, if you've got a problem with your brother, if you hate your brother, that's a real problem. A real problem. It, it's such a big problem. Here's what I want you to do. If you come to church, if you come to the temple, and you come to church, and you got a problem with your brother, and really, actually, he says, if you know your brother's got a problem with you, leave your gift. 
Don't put it in the offering plate yet. Hold your gift. It might, by the way, be the gift of your worship. Just hold it. And go to your brother and make it right. Why? Because he knew, he knew that relationships with our brother with a, with a good heart was paramount. It was huge. And, and then, then the law said, do not commit adultery. And Jesus ramps it up again. He says, let's, let's go beyond the letter of the law. If you look at a woman to lust after her, you're already guilty of adultery. Now, again, you can see that could be a, wait, 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 wait. Okay, the physical act, I got that, but you mean lust? Yeah. And that becomes real feasible with a toxic heart particularly. We're going to see that today. With a toxic heart, that becomes really a problem. It's such a big problem that Jesus said, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to make sure it doesn't happen. In fact, he said this, if your eye offend thee, gouge it out. And I I remember last week making a point. You know what the Greek says? It means gouge out. He wasn't using hyperbole. He wasn't trying to say, well, this is just symbolism. No. He was saying, if your eye offend thee, get rid of it. He said, "If if your hand offend thee, cut it off. Why? Because he knew the importance of a pure heart. And whatever would lead us down this path of of adultery or this path of of wanting what is not ours, a, a thought process, get rid of it. Because it's better to get rid of it than experience the judgment of God. And and then the law said, do not steal. And I remember last week telling you, it was kind of, you know, in the the Sermon on the Mount, you know, know, Jesus said, you know, talked about murder and he talked about adultery, but he didn't really talk about stealing. But he did illustrate it for us. You know, he, he, he went to the time. In fact, I told you, every time that Jesus talked about thieves and robbers, he was talking to the religious people. And in particular, the religious leaders. And he talked about them being thieves and robbers of the things that belong to God. And the illustration we used last week, the story we told last week, was one day Jesus went into the temple and they turned it into a spiritual super Walmart. But unlike Walmart, who offers the lowest prices, they were charging exorbitant prices. They were ripping the people off. And then God got mad. The day God got mad... He starts flipping tables over. And and one time, he takes a a cord of of ropes and starts lashing out at these people. And what was the problem? The problem, he said, my house was called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. They had taken the house of God and turned it into something for themselves and not for the worship of God. Wow. And I said, well, maybe, wow. Wow. Maybe just like, maybe that's like when God turned the temple upside down, maybe it's so important that we don't become guilty of that kind of thing in our lives that God turns our temple world upside down. That whatever it takes, including our our twisted faith, where we somehow think that we're, God is blessed because we're on his team. We've done enough good work, so God's going, good job. We forget what grace is all about that none of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve the blessings we've gotten. It's all by His grace. So when you have this toxic heart going on, you've got this tormented soul, you've got this sour mind going on, it's awful easy to hate your brother. It's awful easy to lust. It's awful easy to steal the things of God, including your faith, and turn into something that God never intended. We were left here. Listen, we were left here not to to have some health and wealth and prosperity gospel. We were left here to glorify God. Let me just tell you something. When we get to heaven, it's one big praise fest, not for you, but for Jesus. But for Jesus. Heaven's just one great big praise fest. It's all about him. So then, then we kind of, we bled over into a parallel between John 10.10. Did you see that? We had, we had three, we had three, and now John 10.10 comes along and gives us three more. And it's a great parallel because we want to bring that from, the, from Exodus 20 all the way up into the age of grace. And Jesus says these words. He says, the thief comes to steal, 
to kill and destroy. And in the larger context, that thief is who? In the large context, is Satan. You know, that last slide in the movie, toward the end there, where it says, Satan hates you. And his job description is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But here, listen, here's the scary part. The scary part is when we start acting like Satan. When we become the stealers, when we become the killers, and we become the destroyers, when our mental attitude becomes the thief and we say, what is yours is mine and I'm going to take it. What is yours is mine and I'm going to take it. Whether it be a wife, whether it be character assassination, whatever it might be, when we become the thief, and we put ourselves at the very front of the line instead of the back of the line, and we start taking what is not ours to take. And then, when you do that, there's going to be circumstances, and that's where the killing part comes in. You see, we have a real tendency to try to control the outcome, don't we? When we, when, when we take and steal, there are consequences. Oh, my gosh. We, we saw it in, in one of the movies we, sh- we showed here, you know, where, where the guy started embezzling money, and he tried to control the outcome, and he couldn't. Well, often when we become that thief, and what is yours is mine, and I'm going to take it, then when things go south, we try to control the outcome, and we'll do whatever necessary to do that. And here, if you're, if you're a mathematician, write this down. Stealing and killing equals destruction. Stealing and killing. When we start having the mentality that I'm number one, I'm most important, it's me who matters, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine, and what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. When we start experiencing the consequences of that, and we do everything we can to control the outcome of that. Neglected families, an affair, uh, embezzlement at the company, a bad choice on a Friday night in the back seat of a car, cheating on a test that leads to expulsion. When we start doing that, things are going to get destroyed. And we need to be careful. And students, that's you. You know, choices you make as a student sometimes can have lifelong consequences. And sir or ma'am, you think decisions you make in marriage is you can control the outcome. Sometimes you can't, and it will leave lasting effects. Some of you no longer work for a company you used to work for because you couldn't control the outcome. And it led to destruction. So what I want to do this morning is I want to go back to 2 Samuel 11 and 12. I want to go back to a look at David's life and specifically his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband. Now I know of all the stories in the Bible, see this is one of those stories that you tell somebody, y'all read your Bible, it's pretty interesting. But When it comes to this particular story, most of us know the story. But I hope we can bring some fresh insight and fresh truth from it that will help us as we deal with do not murder, do not commit adultery, and do not steal. You know, why why are you taking this field trip? You know, field trips are cool. It means you didn't have to go to class. Field trip was something different. Why, Dwayne? Well, I was listening to Matt Chandler speak. Matt's, Matt Chandler is a young, younger pastor. And he was talking about the, the need to faithfully preach the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, even when it's not comfortable. And he's talking about how that we must not run from difficult situations. And then he said these words. He said, you know, a parent who will let their child play in traffic does not love their kids. So he said, when I get my kid, I don't know if he's actually done this or not, or with the illustration, that doesn't matter. But he said, if my kid's playing in the traffic, I'm going to get the kid out of the traffic, bring him to the side, and look him dead in the eye. And he's going to say, does daddy love you? 
Yes, yes, Daddy, you love me. Does Daddy like to have fun? Yes, 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 Daddy, you like to have fun. Do you remember when we did? Yes, Daddy, I remember. We like to have fun. He goes, don't play in the road. And the kid goes, but why, Daddy? And he points to a roadkill squirrel smashed on the pavement and says, that's why. I want to visit David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. I want David to be our dead squirrel today. I want somehow, I want somehow, I want somehow the word of God to impact us so greatly we will run from sin. I want David to be our dead squirrel. Now there's, there's a few things I want to visit real quickly. I told you this introduction was kind of long. There's a few things I want to visit with you about David so you'll get the big picture, so you'll understand. So you'll get that fresher perspective. First off, David, you're right. David, who about age 12 or 13, killed Goliath. Who had enough faith to pick up five stones, even though he's going to need one, and walk out and face that nine-foot giant and sling that stone and hit him in the forehead and kill him. That David... That David, who later, even though he'd been anointed as king of Israel, was still on the run because the problem was there was another king, and the other king wanted to kill David. So Saul chased David all over creation. And so finally David is hiding in a cave. And King Saul, now again, you need to read your Bible. King Saul had to go to the bathroom. So he happened to choose that cave. So he goes in and derobes himself to go to the bathroom. And David's hiding, and his men are saying, this is the moment, this is the opportunity. God's brought you to this point, kill him. And David reaches over and cuts the corner off of his robe and says, I cannot kill him, for he is God's anointed. David understood there would come a time when he would be king, but Saul's death would not be by his hand, it would be by God's hand. This man who made that courageous decision when Saul gets done and walks out of the, out of the cave, he, he walks to the mouth of the cave with the piece of robe. And here's what I want you to see. He felt incredibly guilty because he even cut the robe of the king of Israel, even though that man was trying to kill him. That's the man, a man who killed a giant, the man who had the courage to trust God to take care of his enemies. A man who the Bible says was a man after God's own heart. That is the man this story is written about. David was not immature when this happens. I mean, you know, we all make childhood mistakes. All of us have things that we did as teenagers, and we go back and say, boy, I wish I hadn't done that one. And sometimes y'all will tell me your life before Jesus, and, you know, when you were 18, you did this. I'm going, are you kidding me? I mean, it's just, I'm just amazed. All of us have stories. David is 50 years old. Goliath was in the past. Saul and his, and his willingness to trust God was in the past. Most of the Psalms, you remember the Psalms in the Old Testament that was the Jewish hymn book? David wrote a huge chunk of those. Talking about trusting God, waiting on God, loving God. Those are in the hymn book. He's 50 years old. This is not immaturity. This is not small faith. This is David being crazy. The sermon title comes from the thought, Dave, Crazy Dave's Crazy Ivan. And a crazy Ivan is something that still occurs today. It's when Russian submarine captains, as they cruise the Atlantic, will suddenly turn left or turn right as hard as they can. And that is their way. Once they turn, the sonar will be able to pick up the enemy behind them, an American submarine. 
And they called it Crazy Ivan. And when, when they're following these Russian submarines, and all of a sudden he turns hard left or hard right, the captain cries out, Crazy Ivan, Crazy Ivan. And they suddenly kill the engines in hopes that the Russian won't detect them. David pulls a Crazy Ivan. Now look at me. A man after God's own heart. If a man who killed giants, if a man who is willing to trust God with his enemy can pull a crazy Ivan, so can you. And so can you. And so can you. And so can you. And so can I. Understand how applicable this is today. The third thing is this. This deal with Bathsheba for our purposes today. And I, I try to stay true to the Word of God, so I want to be very careful. But for our purpose today, would you just go wider? Would you go wider? Because the, the real application of this message is the fact that David, with a toxic mind or, or a crazy soul or, or tormented heart, whatever reason it was, you know, David does something cr incredibly out of character. You may not have a Bathsheba, but you may have a temptation to do something on the job, such as, again, embezzlement, cheating on your taxes, that could ultimately have grave consequences. Students, this Friday night, you may be out with your boyfriend, and mommy and daddy won't be there, and neither will brother Brent, and you may be tempted to go where you should not go. If it could happen to Dave, it could happen to you. Sir, ma'am, you're at work, and you're not near as good looking as you think you are. But she thinks you, is, you are. She thinks you are. And you just might be tempted. Go broader than Bathsheba this morning. What is it? Listen, what is it that could happen? What is it that is happening? What is on the horizon right now in your life? What is on the horizon right now in your life that could possibly become the thing you give into that could destroy your family and your future? What is it on the horizon? What is it right now the groundwork is being laid? What is it that you're involved in right now that if it came to light, it could destroy your future or destroy your family. That's your Bathsheba. And we want to see how this happened. And really next week, give me one more week with this. Next week, we're going to look at, at how it all, how healing, how healing comes, how forgiveness comes. We'll see the touch of it today. But next week, Come back. Come back. Now, there's one thing you need to know. Is that forgiveness does not remove consequences. Because sometimes our, our logic, our mentality is, no matter what it is, remember, whatever it is out there on your horizon, whatever is right now on your, in your forefront, or whatever it is you're involved in, you've got it in your brain, well, God will forgive me. I'm a product of grace. God will forgive me. And he will when there's repentance. But you remember this, the consequences will not disappear. Satan won't tell you that. The liar won't tell you that. He'll tell you, well, you know, you're under grace. God will forgive you. And listen, maybe your wife, maybe your employer. But the consequences will never totally go away. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, and we'll hit this at the end too. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now we've got to jump. We've, we've got to go. In 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now again, we can't tell the whole story. It's not my intention to tell the whole story, but we want to get some highlights from this. We're going to start reading in verse number two. In verse number two of 2 Samuel chapter 11. The Bible says there, one evening, he was in the palace. One day, David got up from his bed and strolled around on the roof of the palace. Why? 
He was bored out of his brain. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. But they do say that an idle mind is the devil's workshop. There's a lot of truth to that. It's not scriptural, but there's a lot of truth. So David was bored that night. And the Bible says one evening he, he got up, he strolled around. From the roof he saw a woman bathing, a very beautiful woman. Again, we don't have time to go into all the details of this, but just don't be quick to throw Bathsheba under the bus. So David sent someone to inquire about her, and he reported, the messenger reported, this is Bathsheba, um, and she's the daughter of Eliam, and the wife, the wife, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, you need to know about Uriah. Uriah was one of David's bodyguards. Uriah was a mighty man of valor, the Bible called him. He's an incredible warrior and close to the king. And the report comes back, that's the daughter of Eliam and the wife, the wife, the wife of Uriah. There was a time, there was a time in David's life, it may have, back, may have started back when he was a giant killer. It, it may have been when, when he had the, the, the foresight to say, I will not touch God's anointed. It was that prime time when, when the author said, a man after God's own heart, he wouldn't have given this a second thought. When the word wife came out, it was done. No way, no way, I will not sin against my God. No way, but something's happened. David's the king, and he's been king a while. David's a little older, David's a little bored with life. And he needs something to spice it up. And he said, after all, I'm the king, I can do what I want to do. Let me tell you something. As long as there's a heavenly king and you're his child, you can't do whatever you want. I don't care how much power, I don't care how much money, I don't care how much authority or what title you got. When you belong to the king, you can't act as king. Now you write that down. Because the temptation will come. The temptation will come for you to act like the king. So David, the Bible says, so David uh, sent messengers to get her, and when she had come to him, he slept with her. Now, she'd just been done purifying herself for her uncleanness, and afterwards, she returned home. And oh, the woman conceives and sent word to form David, I am pregnant. He thought it was all over. He thought it was all done. One night stand, all done. Uriah would never know. The people would never know. The soldiers would never know. Let me tell you something. I don't, again, whatever it is you've got going on or you see on your horizon, don't you think it'll remain a secret. Before, probably before she got back to the house, the palace staff was talking. Mark it down. It ain't going to stay a secret. And by the way, God's watching. Just in case you forgot. God's watching. So he begins by stealing the wife of Uriah. He, he took what was not his. And that is a dangerous first step. And stealing leads to killing. Again, not necessarily a murder in the physical act. In this case, it was actual murder. But when you choose to control the outcome at whatever cost, something's going to die. Something's going to die. So, again, to save time, we're going to, we're going to move forward. We're going, to, we're going to look ahead. When David hears this, he sends word to Uriah, who's out on the battlefront. He says, hey, send Uriah. He talked to Joab, his commander. Send Uriah home. So Uriah comes home, and David greets him. Isn't this crazy? David, hey, Uriah, my best bud, how are you doing? Glad you're home. How's the battle going? How are things going on the battlefield? Hey, listen. Why don't you go home tonight and stay with your wife? What's the plan? He could claim that Uriah was the daddy. Well, the problem was, Uriah had a lot more integrity than David. And Uriah wouldn't go home. He said, in fact, when David asked him, why didn't you go home? He said, how could I go home and sleep with my wife in my house when, when my brothers in arms are sleeping in tents? How can I do that? So David, it's not a problem because he's, he's the master controller of the circumstances. 
So he brings Uriah back. Hey, come back and have a few meals with me. And gets Uriah drunk. And kind of points Uriah in the right direction, says, go home, bud. And even in his drunken state, he had more integrity than David at this point. And he sleeps on the doorstep of the king. So now what is David going to do? David is going to control the outcome. David is going to do whatever it takes to control the outcome, just like you and just like me would, just like I would do. He's going to control the outcome no matter what. So the Bible says, now we're in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 14. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, the commander, and sent it with Uriah. He writes the letter, Uriah's own death warrant, and sends it with him to the battlefront to Joab. Here's what the letter said. In the letter, he wrote, put Uriah in the front of the fiercest fighting, then withdraw from him so he may be struck down and die. When Joab was besieging the city, he put Uriah in the place where he knew the enemy, best enemy soldiers were. Then the men of the city came out and attacked Joab, and some of the men from David's soldiers fell in battle, and Uriah the Hittite also died. Joab sent someone to report to David all the details of the battle. David says, put him where he's certain to die. And that's exactly what Joab did, because Joab's the servant of the king. Joab's getting a paycheck. He just does what the king says to do. Now, giant killer, truster of God with the enemies, man after God's own heart. How could he do this? I'm telling you, if he can, we can. I don't, well, I do know. I don't think in his case it was a, demented soul. I, I don't think it was probably a tormented mind. I think it was a toxic heart. I think pride, I think arrogance just saturated his heart to the point where whatever I want to do, I can do. And man, when you start thinking that, watch out. Watch out. Disaster is coming. So your eyes dead. Time passes, and now we're in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 7. Time passes, God sends a prophet. He sends Nathan. And he tells him this story. He said, I need to tell you a story, David. He goes, well, what's the story? He said, well, there's a man, a poor man. He had one lamb, just one. And it's kind of like a pet to him even. I mean, he didn't even think about eating this dude. He was like a pet. And there's a rich man. He had lots and lots of lambs. And the rich man had some company come in. So rather than take one of his sheep that he had a lot of and kill and feed the company, he took the poor man's leap, lamb. The, the, the one was just like a pet. He took it and he killed it and ate it. And David was just filled with anger. He says, this should not be. This man must suffer death. <laughs> and then, I thought it was kind of funny. He's got to die, but before he dies, he needs to give him four lambs, four times. And then Nathan says these words. Nathan replied to David, you are the man. David is you. And what David thought he could control, he couldn't control. And what, and what David thought would remain a secret doesn't remain a secret. And listen to me, Satan will lie to you. He will tell you that you can, that you can keep it a secret, that you can control the outcome. Don't you believe him? He's a liar. He's a liar. You're the man. And look what he says. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I, I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Judah and Israel, the united kingdom. And if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. Nathan, God reminds David, David, look what I've done for you. Oh, can I pause and remind you today? Think what God has done for you. If nothing else, you say, well, I'm poor. I don't have this, I don't have that. Think of that. Think of that. 
Think of the day that Jesus Christ bled and died and endured the wrath of God that you could have your sins forgiven. Not to mention all the other stuff, but the fact that he died for you. David forgot. He forgot it was God, it was God, it was God. He was a lonely, he was a shepherd boy whose job was to follow after the sheep. And God took him and made him king. Nothing more than grace. Old Testament grace. The only reason he was who he was because of God's amazing grace. But he forgot. And look at me. If David can forget, you can forget too. Look for verse, uh, verse 9. It's like a knife in the heart. Why then, why then have you despised the commandment of the Lord by doing what I consider evil? Oh, let that question pierce your heart. Why have you despised the command of the Lord by doing what I considered evil? You struck down your ride the Hittite with a sword, and you took his wife as your own wife. You murdered him with, with the Ammonite sword. Watch. Now, therefore, now, therefore, the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. Consequences. He thought he had it all under control. He thought it was all going to be a big secret. He just forgot the God factor. God wasn't going to let it just be swept away. God was going to let it just disappear. He brought glory to his name. And he teaches David this very valuable lesson about consequences. I'm trying to debate in my mind, I know we have young people here, but I want you to understand clearly what the consequences were in David's life. Because again, depending on, really depending on what it is, but, but regardless, no, no, regardless. The future of your family and you are on the balance. Your family, your sons, your daughters, your grandchildren. This thing does not just impact you. It impacts you and those around you. So a little bit down the road. You need, again, you need to read your Bible. David has a son named Ammon. And I won't use the word I should use, but he assaults his sister. Ammon assaults his sister Tamar and then despises her. Then Absalom finds out what Ammon did and he murders Ammon. So you got the brother assaulting the sister, the brother killing the brother. Now, let me read that verse again. Now, therefore, the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of your ride the Hittite to be your own wife. Sin has consequences. Someone say amen. I want to make sure you got that. Sin, this wasn't God doing this. This was the fact that when his family, when his sons saw what kind of man daddy was, it impacted them. It impacted them. So, sir, ma'am, student, before you say, I'll do what I want to do, think of the impact, both in time and the future, but also the people that you love. And then, real quickly, in verse number 11, this is what the Lord says, I'm going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes, and he will sleep with them in public. You have acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel in broad daylight. And it happened. Absalom leads a revolt against his father. And to show that he was in control, he slept with David's concubines on the roof of the palace in a tent that all would know that David had been dethroned. Just like God said, it happened. 
Now, David says, David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And to which I would say, you sure did. But Nathan said to David, this is the good news. The Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. God in his grace didn't give David what he deserved. And by the way, God in his grace doesn't give us what we deserve. What we deserve. But this last verse, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son born to you will die. And he did. And he did. An innocent child dies because a man thought he could do what he wanted to do because he had a toxic heart because he ignored the commands of God. And there were consequences. And there are consequences. So what do we do with that? And I've got about, I've got about one minute. What do we do with that? I think probably that, that verse in Proverbs 14, 12, um, I think that's an important one. There is a way that seems right to a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's important. You, you need to understand that Satan will convince you that whatever you're about to do, whether it be steal, kill, destroy, you know, whatever it is, whether it's you know, murder or adultery or stealing, whatever it is, he'll convince you it's the right way. Just remember the Proverbs 14. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it results in what? Say it with me, death. Something dies when sin's involved. Something dies when sin is involved. Remember that one. And, and remember this. And again, I'm, I'm trying to be mindful of our time. But let me go back to that verse one. I, I left it toward the end on purpose. Let me read it to you. This is the first verse of first, or 2 Samuel 11. In the spring, in the spring, when kings march out to war, in the spring, when kings go out to war, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel. They destroyed the Ammonites and re besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Very powerful truth. David was not supposed to be in Jerusalem. He was supposed to be on the field with his brothers in arms. When we put ourselves in situations and places where we don't need to be, we open the door for sin. We open the door for stealing, killing, and destroying. We open up for adultery, for hatred, and for stealing. Now, there's a big truth here that I snatched from Andy Stanley. And he makes it really clear here. Everybody around David, now watch. And, and guys, men, this is for us too. This pastors. Everyone around David got a paycheck. Everyone around David got all the staff. Everyone got a paycheck. They were owing to David. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No one was there to speak truth into David's life. Pastors need men, not women, men to speak truth into their lives. But it's not a pastoral gig. Every one of us needs people who will speak truth into our lives. We need a friend closer than a brother. And if you're a male, it's a male. If you're a female, it's a female. We need a brother or a sister who will speak truth into our lives. And I want you to get this. Where were those people? They were on the battlefield. Because on the battlefield, protocol was dropped. They were more like brothers in arms than they were back at the palace as servants. And the men, David had separated himself from the one group of men 
who could speak into his life. And when we separate ourselves, when we isolate ourselves, when we step back from those who can speak truth into our lives, when we go to a church where they preach some milly mouth uh, word of God, when you, step, when you decide, I don't need church anymore. I don't need anyone telling me what to do. When, you, when you've got a fringe and you pull back from your friends who will speak truth to you, you are an incredibly dangerous place. Be careful. Because yes, there's grace. And yes, there's forgiveness. But there are consequences that could well and probably will last a lifetime. Now, next week, we are going to look at the scripture that describes in detail David's journey back to God. It went beyond, God, I'm sorry. And I hope you'll come back next week. It may be something in your past you've never dealt with totally. And you need to hear next week's message. You certainly need to hear for the future. But some of you might be where you are right now and you are so miserable and God wants to take that away. And we'll learn that next week. So you bow your heads, please. So where are you today? What is your Bathsheba? Is there one? Now be very careful because you've got to be honest. What is it on your horizon? What is it in your immediate future? What is it right now that's happening? That's your Bathsheba. What is it? What is it? Now, I firmly believe, first off, 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we have power and authority over sin and Satan. Would you say amen to that? So the answer is a make sure we are totally surrendered, that our heart is totally after God and not after other things. That we don't think we are the king, that we're in subject to the king. That's huge. That's huge. And secondly, simply, don't separate yourself from the people who will speak truth into your life. It may be the person you're married to. That should be your best friend. That person should be able to speak truth into your life. And you need to hear it. I'm blessed to have a good friend that we speak honestly and completely open with. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have someone who will speak truth into your life? And I think it was Proverbs chapter 4 last week. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Because out of it are the issues of life. My brother Brent's going to be standing there. You may want to come and have someone pray with you. That'd be great. That'd be cool. Maybe you want to pray right there where you are. Maybe you heard enough of the gospel about the man who died on this cross for our sins. That you want to know how you can have forgiveness of your sins. Any way we can help you, that's what this is all about today.